Welcome to Worship at Fairlawn United. My name is Jean Ward. I am so glad you're able to gather with us this morning. If this is your first time, welcome. If you've been away for a while, welcome back. It's the second Sunday in Advent, and today we're going to walk a bit with Elizabeth and Mary, meet the Archangel Gabriel, and hear the news that he brings that will change their lives. I want to remind you of Eleanor Daly's music offerings and invite you to make use of her gift to us as your week unfolds, music that speaks to the soul. As we begin this service, I want to read to you some words from Brian Wren, musician and wordsmith. How can a baby change the world, even before it is born? The proud seem quite secure. The seats of power look unshaken. The hungry are unfed, and the rich take plenty away. So how can a baby change the world? And yet, when it stirs in the womb, it changes somebody's world. And when a child is born, our lives are changed forever. Who knows at birth what a child will become? Did Mary sing her song when her son left home, when he sat on a hillside, hung on a cross, and shattered the tomb? Then how can a baby not change the world? Who knows what a child will become? For when in a home or a nation, new life surges, strong as the incoming tide, it changes the shape of the shoreline so that even the castles of power are like sand. Let us pray. Holy and gracious one, God of our mother and fathers, we give you thanks this day and every day. Thank you for this gift of life, a precious blessing, that we may magnify your name. Be with us as we labor through this life. Be with us as we struggle through pain. Be with us in our suffering. Be with us through the storms, the ice, snow, wind, real or metaphor. Be with us this day. Be with us as we labor to birth new life whatever that new life might be. Be with us that we can be your hands and heart in a broken world. Amen. To light the second candle today for Advent, we invite the Denbach Tempest Femme. This Advent, despite hardship and isolation, we feel love's power to reach out to reach across, to connect, and to restore us in a world where there is so much brokenness. And so we give voice to our spirit's longing for love to find a way in our world. In this season of expectant waiting, we hold our breath. We yearn for love that makes us whole. When we feel lonely, when we feel left behind, when we don't know where to turn, God settles in a, into our hearts as love. On that foundation, with that potential, and that newness, we feel trust growing. Into the loneliness, love seeps. Into the despair, love caresses and coaxes. Everything leans into love. Light the candle, honey. One purple candle. Love burst into flames, lights the path we take together. Our reader for this morning is Kathy Salisbury, who brings us a story from Luke. Good 
Good morning. Madeline Langle, besides writing absolutely wonderful young adult fiction, was also a person of faith. This is what she had to say about Luke's story concerning the Archangel Gabriel's visit to Mary. What an amazing, what an impossible message the angel brought to a young girl. And so the life of Jesus began, as it would end, with the impossible. When he was a man, a grown man, he would say to his disciples, for human beings, it is impossible. For God, nothing is impossible. Possible things are easy to believe. The glorious impossibles are what bring joy to our hearts, hope to our lives, and songs to our lips. As you listen to this story from Luke, what surprises you? What speaks to you? What makes you wonder? Our reading today is Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 45 and 56. When Elizabeth was six months pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David's house. The virgin's name was Mary. When the angel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever and there will be no end to his kingdom. Then Mary said to the angel, how will this happen since I haven't had relations with a man? The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come over you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the one who is to be born will be holy. He will be called God's son. Look, even in her old age, your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son. This woman who was labeled unable to conceive is now six months pregnant. Nothing is impossible for God. Then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just as you have said. And then the angel left her. Mary got up and hurried to a city in the Judean highlands. She entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped with joy in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. With a loud voice, she blurted out, God has blessed you above all women, and he has blessed the child you carry. Why do I have this honor that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. Happy is she who believed the Lord would fulfill the promises he made to her. Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then returned to her home. In this reading, we hear God's voice. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. My grandfather was a storyteller. I spent a lot of time on the small farm where my grandfather and grandmother lived in West River Station, Nova Scotia. When I was a child, I'd go there many, many weekends and would spend large portions of my summer holidays there. My grandfather told great stories, absolutely great stories. They weren't always necessarily truthful stories in that he um, rather exaggerated the truth sometimes told incredible ghost stories. He had the ability to keep an audience quite spellbound. My favorite time of year to be on the farm uh, was in late fall and winter. I loved the way it got dark so early. And at that point on the farm, there was no electricity, no indoor plumbing. Um, you didn't even get water inside. You went outside to the well. Um, so 
it when it got dark you had to light all the lamps and it was quite wonderful and there was always that wonderful wood stove in the kitchen that we would feed with wood and feed with wood until all of us fuss were as toasty warm as you could possibly be before we would go to bed my grandfather would go down to the barn to make sure everything was all right and when i was there i would go with him so he would light the lamp that we would take outside with us the farm itself was on a hillside um, with tracks, uh, the railroad tracks above it. And we would walk down this long driveway to, uh, to a gravel road that went along our farm. And we would turn right on the road and walk down a bit. And there would be, was the barn on the left-hand side of the road. And the barn was, and the fields that were some oats and things like that were planted, um, was bounded by a river, a, a river that went along. And this area was always called the interval, which is an old New England kind of word for, for low-lying land that, um, that is along a river. So when we would go down there at night to say, uh, make sure the animals were all right and to say good night to them, um, I always felt like I was in a magical place. First of all, I was with my grandfather and I was the oldest grandchild and, uh, and I just delighted in his attention. But it was magical for other reasons. It was magical because of the darkness, because of the light of the lamp. Uh, because of, of the animals, my grandfather still farmed with horses, because of the cow, because of the chickens and the rooster, and of course because of all the cats. It was magical because we talked to the animals and made sure they were all right. And then we would walk, walk back to the farm with a sense that all was right in our world, and that for the night we would put stories to rest and go to sleep. Later in the late 70s at seminary in Vancouver, I was to discover an American theologian and storyteller, John Shea, and a book he wrote called Stories of God and Unauthorized Biography. And for the first time as an adult, I read someone who truly understood the power of story. He says about his book, he said, this explores the stories the folks tell when they gather to break the bread. As Christians, we have inherited ancient stories that carry the faith convictions of our people. And although these stories may start with long ago, they end with right now. And he went on to say, when we reach our limits, when our ordered worlds collapse, when we cannot enact our moral ideals, when we are disenchanted, we often enter into the awareness of mystery. We are inescapably related to this mystery, which is imminent and transcendent, which issues invitations we must respond to, which is ambiguous about its intentions, and which is real and important beyond all else. Our dwelling within mystery is both menacing and promising, a relationship of exceeding darkness and undeserved light. In this situation, with this awareness, we do a distinctively human thing. We gather together and tell stories of God to calm our terror and hold our hope on high. I think his words have a lot to say about stories like the one about Mary and Elizabeth that we heard this morning. The story of Mary and Elizabeth and the archangel is not for the faint of heart, really especially if you believe that the story itself leads to a burning encounter with God. Mary, overwhelmed by all that had happened, hurried off to the hill country to see her cousin Elizabeth. Sometimes when you're that age, it's really important to have an older friend who is not a parent, um, who is able to be both loving and objective. Wonders of wonders when she finally got to Elizabeth's and, uh, and they got talking, she discovered that Elizabeth was pregnant too. That she too had accepted this glorious impossible that Madeleine Langle talks about, this glorious impossible without reservation or doubt. How marvelous. With God, nothing is impossible. 
The stars in the sky above Mary and Elizabeth were brilliant and the power that created all the galaxies, all the stars in their courses had come into the womb of a young unmarried woman and she said yes to the glorious impossible task that lay ahead. So what does this long ago story have to do with right now? Our right now, our world's right now, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of much social unrest, in the midst of racial tension and disparities between the rich and the poor. This is the truly frightening part about some of the stories that are passed down to us. You see, the love we long for is something that we must give birth to. The justice we long for is something we must give birth to. The peace and justice that transforms the world must come from us. Our opening openness to the harsh truths of our world and our own complicity in the evils of this world. A hard yes, a difficult yes, is demanded of us. The 13th century philosopher, theologian, and mystic, Meister Eckhard, echoes this. He said, we are all meant to be mothers of God. What good is it to me if this eternal birth of the divine son takes place unceasingly, but does not take place within myself. And what good is it to me if Mary is full of grace, if I am also not full of grace? And what good is it to me for the creator to give birth to his son, if I do not also give birth to him in my time and in my culture? This then is the fullness of time when the son of man is begotten in us. Incarnation is an ongoing and steady process, not just an historic event. But like Mary, we are given the gift of choice. We can say yes to a creative, genitive, transformative calling, or we can shrink in self-doubt, discouragement, or fear. I've discovered an author that I thought I had never heard of before recently. It's because of some reading that my husband Nigel is doing. Howard Thurman was born in 1900 and lived 81 years. A black man born in Florida, born out of a history of slavery, who listened very carefully to his grandmother's stories. A great spiritualist and mystic one of the great preachers of the 20th century, a spiritual advisor to Martin Luther King and the first black dean at a white university. Here's something he wrote from the mood of Christmas and other celebrations. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins. To find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among the people, to make music in the heart. Isn't that beautiful? If it sounds familiar, it's because it's almost word for word the lyrics to I am the light of the world in our United Churches, Voices United. But his name is not named. Nigel was the first to discover this. He came to me and said, listen to this. What does that remind you of? And I recognized it immediately. A hard truth, friends. If we are to birth God into our world, we have to face some harsh truths especially if we are white. If we are to be mothers of God, 
then we have to face our own complicity in the wrongs of this world and this place. We need to listen to the stories of others and understand their power. We need to be able to relinquish the privilege that is ours only because of race, because of skin color. And we need to acknowledge that to birth God in this place and time is to embrace the difficult and the dangerous act of truth-telling and repentance. Alice Walker, the great American writer, said of Howard Thurman, in those long midnight hours when morning seems weeks away, the words of Howard Thurman have kept watch with me. I want to end with these words that Howard wrote in Meditations of the Heart. I make an act of faith toward humankind where doubts would linger and suspicions brood. I make an act of joy toward all sad hearts where laughter pales and tears abound. I make an act of strength toward feeble things where life grows dim and death draws near. I make an act of trust toward all of life where fears preside and distrust keep watch. I make an act of life toward friend and foe where trust is weak and hate burns bright. I make a deed to God of all my days and look out on life with quiet eyes. The story of Mary and Elizabeth is more than a story of an old woman and a young woman who encounter in the mystery of God a question about who and how they are to be in the world. They are asked to say yes to something that is difficult. If we are to be mothers of God in this time and in this place, out of our own cultures, we must speak and act. We must acknowledge that humankind was created in the image of God. And if this world is to change, it is to change because of the work that we do and the truth telling that we are able to do and the repentance that we are able to enact and the love that we are able to embrace. Thanks be to God for the love of God and for the task ahead. Amen. And now we are delighted to have a quartet called I Sing of a Maiden, sung by our treble section leads.
Let us pray. Holy God, Mother of creation, conceiving time and space and bringing life to birth, we praise you. Distinct from all other creatures, yet intimately connected, you watch over us and all the human race. You know us through and through, call us by name, and fill us with dignity and worth. And although we ignore your warnings, run from your embrace, and turn our back on your kindness, nothing can separate us from your love. Show us your passion for our good and your compassion for all. If we are trapped and imprisoned, set us free. If we have broken your commandments, forgive us and set us on a new course. If we have strayed and lost our way, bring us home. Give life and hope to your church and to cities and towns, neighborhoods and nations that long for new vision and new birth in these pandemic times. Rekindle among us the good news that in Jesus Christ the desert can bloom, the lost can be found, and young and old can be reborn. Grow in our hearts the hope of ultimate newness, before and after death, and in your new creation. To you, living God, our mother, father, and friend, we give ourselves as Christ's body in thanksgiving and praise. As children turn to a mother who watches over them, let us turn to God saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we move closer and closer to Christmas, a Christmas different for all of us all over the world, I invite you to go to our website and see all the offerings we have for this season. Lessons and Carols, The Longest Night, Family Christmas Eve, and others. And I invite you as well to join us, if you are able, for coffee chat at 11.15 following this service. The link was sent to you this morning along with this worship link. And now a blessing. The world now is too dangerous and too beautiful for anything but love. May your eyes be so blessed you see God in everyone, your ears so you hear the cry of the poor. May your hands be so blessed that everything you touch is a sacrament, your lips so you speak nothing but the truth with love. May your feet be so blessed you run to those who need you. And may your heart be so opened, so set on fire, that your love, your love, changes everything. Go in peace. Amen.